Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, um, sorry, one second. Good. Um, could you please just shut those doors? Is that, is that okay? Can you close that door, please? Let's see. Um, so we better um, kick it off. Is, are there any any questions from our last lecture? No. Okay. Um, so today um, I will be uh, talking about a couple of um, more topics from, from your Thermal 1 unit to recap um, what you've already learned based on your thermodynamic, uh, first thermodynamic last year. And then um, we will be using them again. We will be using them while we are analyzing the cycles. So hopefully I'm going to be finishing these um, Thermal 1 reviewing today. And from next week onward, we will be uh, looking into Thermal 2 stuff mostly on um, um, cycles. Um, so this lecture is on the uh, heat engine and the and second law of thermodynamics. So if you remember from last lecture, first law is actually deals with the conservation of energy. But we know that energy, in addition to the... Uh, quantity, it also has a quality, and also we know that process occur in, processes occur in, in, in certain directions, so it, it doesn't happen in any direction. So second law actually helps us to, um, uh, to identify the direction where the energy flow, energy transfers, and also help us to identify the quality of energy. Um, now, so the first concept is actually a heat engine, which we'll be dealing with this uh, in Thermal 2, um, is a machine which converts heat to work. So work here is, th is thermodynamic work. An obvious example could be a power plant, or a steam power plant, or co a coal power plant, or a geothermal plant, or a solar um, power generation system. What it has, it actually... Um, um, It, 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 it deals with, it has a three main parameters. Uh, oh gosh. So it has a hot reservoir. There's a mismatch between. Um, yeah. The pointer is here, but the line is there. So I have to better be off the. Um, Okay, um, I hope that you see it now. I'm going to zoom in a bit. So it, it, the, main, the three main features are, are actually the main um, elements of a heat engine. That it deals with a hot reservoir, which is at the temperature of at, as a high temperature, right? That's where you, there's a source of energy. Then it also deals with the 
a, a, a sink for energy or, or a cold reservoir at the low temperature of TC, sometimes we denote it as TL, um, and then it actually uh, gets energy or heat from this high temperature source and it produces work for us and there is a cyclic engine here that converts part of this heat energy to work and the rest will be rejected or wasted to the low temperature uh, reservoir. It's very much like a power plant, I mean a, a steam power, um, cycle which I'm showing here. Um, so as you can see, uh, this is a cycle here where you have a liquid at this state. It pumps in here to the high pressure, comes into a boiler, so heat is absorbed here. It goes to turbine, produce work for us. Vapor comes into condenser, rejects heat to outside, comes back to its original state to be liquid, and then the cycle repeats, right? So we have a Q in coming in, or Q H, or Q in. There's a Q out, or Q L, at lower temperature of TL. Here is a high temperature of TH, and a work produced. So it's a set three main, main, main components. Um, there's a nice video that's showing how a heat engine actually works in a very, very um, simplified demonstration. So the video doesn't play here, so I have to show you on YouTube, so um, let's see, it is a nice one, let's see how it works and how it will have the three main parameters we just said. Okay, this is good, why? Okay, anybody knows why the speaker doesn't work? No? No? That's bizarre. good thing is that we still have our friends are coming to lecture, so we can save some time here. Guys, you're going to join me here or you're going to sit somewhere? Could you please close that door for me, please? Sorry for that. Anyway, guys, we have to go with uh, no sound here. I don't know what, what the problem is. Okay. Um, so, I can I explain to you what is going on here? It's a can. Um, empty can but there's a water in it and there are a few holes three four holes drilled on the uh, uh, on, on the can so what is he doing he's now attached to a string and then he put it here on a, on a flame or a fire and then let's see uh, what happens So now it's on fire, so we expect that the water is will be converted to vapor. I think you, here you can see um, the holes, if I can show you. See, these are the small holes here. Right. So you see that the vapor is coming out now, or the steam is coming out. Now it's just start to spinning. 
So the, the added energy by burning a fuel here, been given to this, the, the water within the chamber, in this, in this chamber, and now it's not produced work for us. So if you can control this, maybe attach it to a shaft, then you will be able to produce the generated electricity. This is actually what a heat engine in general, it, it looked like, I mean, uh, the way that it works. Okay, are we, are we happy with this video? Okay, now, um, and this is actually the very basic concepts behind the, um, um, the a steam power plant or Rankine cycle, right? They operate based on this heat engine concept. Now, one of the very important parameters which we deal with in, in, in analyzing heat engine is actually thermal efficiency. And it's nothing except that the, what is the output we expect from the machine that we have or the system or the cycle we have divided by what is we give as an input or what we spend here. So the expectation from a heat engine is that we wanted to get work or power from the, the system. But what we spend is the fuel that we burn and we give it to the system as a heat. And that's why you have this W net out divided by Q in. Can anybody tell me what's the meaning of W net out? What, why, why do we have a term net here? Yeah, yeah, now not here for, for this one. This is for this, in this heat engine. Why do we need to define a Q net? The, sorry, W net. Turbine like pump? No, uh, no, uh, the, yeah, you're more or less correct. The pump would require work from us. The turbine doesn't power the pump, actually. So the power, turbine generates power electricity, it goes to the grid, and the pump uses the grid to actually pump the, um, to increase the pressure. Yes, you, I mean, this is true. As a whole, we expend some work to the system through the pump, some goes in, but the, our desired output is actually the turbine work out. So the net's gonna be what has been taken out and what has been given. And this is why we have here W net, which is effectively turbine work minus pump work. And this is Q in, which is the heat has been given to the boiler, right? By burning fuel. So this is what we expend. Um, so, based on the first law of thermodynamics, you know that for a cycle like this, all the energy coming into the system should be called to the energy leaving the, this, this cycle, right? It's, it's a cyclic device. So, the energy, um, I mean, it doesn't go anywhere, it's just there. In should be called to out. Now, what do we have as into the system here? Um, Let me take these things out. So first we just said that W dot net out is actually is this guy, which is W dot turbine. This is positive, it generates for us, minus the work that we give to the system, which is W dot pump, is this pump. So it's a W dot net, right? That, that's what we know. However, if I take these as the the whole system, right? It's a closed one. Um, so what happens is that we have a W coming in and a W going out and the difference between them is W net, but there is a Q coming in and a Q leaving the system. So the first law, first law of thermodynamics says that the total energy into the system should be equal to the total energy leaving the system. Or if you like, you would say that Q in minus Q out should be equal to W turbine minus W pump. Or if you like, it could be say that Q in minus Q out is equal to W net out. Right? You agree with me, right? You get a network output. So where this network output has been, been is coming from this energy that we take it from the uh, high temperature source, minus the energy which has rejected. Or in this system, you can better understand this, that 
This net W out is this guy minus this guy. Huh? It, it's, it's easy peasy. And then, so if we do that, this is a definition that we just had for thermal efficiency in terms of work. And, and if this W, if we write it like this to be Q minus Q out, it can, be, it can be simplified to be written 1 minus Q out over Q in. So you see in this form of uh, presenting um, thermal efficiency, right? It's a W net divided by Q in or Q in minus Q out divided by Q in. Sometimes you might represent to be QL over QH. So L or H represent low or high. Um, so we're happy with this definition? Yeah? Okay. So this is an example, easy peasy. It says that a steam power plant produces 50 megawatt of net work. So here what we have is that W dot net is 50 megawatt. Uh, while burning fuel to produce 150 megawatt of heat energy at the high temperature. So if you like Q, um, Q in, which is Q H, actually is um, 150 megawatt, right? What a rubbish handwriting. Do you really uh, see, can read what I write here? Right? Okay, it's good. Um, it says that find the thermal, the cycle thermal efficiency and the heat rejected by the cycle to the surroundings. So it's, the thermal efficiency is actually W dot net divided by let's say Q dot in and it's going to be 50 divided by 150 so it's going to be uh, uh, nearly 33 percent, right? That's the efficiency. Um, so the heat being rejected to the surroundings, so this should satisfy the first law of thermodynamics. So we know that Q dot in minus Q dot out is actually W dot net. So we have 50 megawatt here, we have 150 here, therefore you Q that out, um, it's just 100 megawatt. Now, I know that you have, you have done um, more complex problems than this in thermal one, so that's going to be to show you how we can use this um, efficiency um, formula. Okay. Now, Another concept which we'll be using in Thermo 2, uh, or another cycle we'll be analyzing, will be heat pump and refrigerator, right? They both have a, a similar thermodynamic cycle, both heat pumps and refrigerators. Only the, the, the purpose of using them are different. Now, let me ask you a question before I get to this point. You, you know that naturally heat is transferred from high temperature source or reservoir or a medium to a low temperature medium, right? Can you give me an example that we have the other way around? That heat will be transferred from a low temperature medium to a high temperature medium. Go ahead. Just please lower him and I'll come back to you. Is that okay? Go ahead. A bit louder, please. NTC, thermistor. How does it work? Is it natural? It's natural. It happens. Okay. So I'm looking for natural. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, that's one example. You go ahead, please. Well done, well done. But it's not natural again, right? <laughs> no, well done in the sense that you're reading my slides, because I see most of your friends are playing with the mobile phone or texting or maybe making notes on the mobile. I don't know how you guys can do this, making notes on your mobile, but that's it. Might be new technology. Yes, so naturally it doesn't happen. But this is actually what we do for heat, in heat pumps and maybe in refrigerators. So what does it do? It actually gets the energy from a low temperature medium inside the fridge, if you imagine, and it delivers to the kitchen, which is hotter. Right? But, but it doesn't do naturally. I mean, nature doesn't allow you to do this. So you need to spend something here. You need to uh, 
give power or electricity to your fridge. And the same for heat pump. Now, the, as I said, they are different, they are the same, but the, the, the purpose, the, the desired output that we get from these two um, technologies are different. In refrigerator, the main objective is to cool down inside the fridge as low as we can. So that QL is the desired output. While in heat pump, we don't care about the QL. We only care about how much heat will be given to, to the high temperature medium we are, we are interested. Now, I can show you an example of, I mean, I'm sure that you have seen these maybe somewhere, in, maybe in your homes or in buildings. Around. This is an evaporator section of the heat pump. This, this component, uh, this is an air source heat pump I'm showing on the top left. Um, it actually gets the energy of the air. There is a refrigerant operating in the heat pump gets the energy even at minus 10 degrees C, it can get that energy, and then delivers heat to the home inside, to the rooms in your house, right? So we wanted to warm up the house as much as we can, so that's the desired output. But the refrigerator is the other way around, we don't care about the heating of the kitchen, we want to cool inside the fridge, right? Now, for heat pump, there are three main types. This is an air source heat pump, or this is a water source heat pump, that they get the energy from the water. If there's a lake or something nearby, they can use that energy. The other one is a ground source heat pump. If you go maybe, I don't know, 10 meters, 20 meters, or maybe three, four meters even. If you go down the three to four meters down in your, in your garden, the temperature there would be something between 10 to 12 degrees C throughout the year, regardless of what the weather conditions outside. At that depth, the temperature is almost constant. And then we take that energy, we boost it through the, the compressor, and then the, the heat will be delivered to the house. Now, um, um, so based on that, the parameter that we define for the refrigeration or heat pump is called COP, or coefficient of performance, which is a desired result divided by required input. Is there any question? Okay, so if it is a fridge, a refrigerator, the desired result is actually how much cooling we get inside the fridge. So it's going to be this is a desired res, uh, result. And the input is the power that we spend. So for the refrigeration, it's going to be QL divided by W. Huh? And for the heat pump, it's the other way around. For a heat pump, we wanted to get as much as heat we can get from the system. It's going to be QH. And the input again going to be the compressor work. Right. So this is for refrigeration, uh, refrigerator, which is QL over W in. And for heat pump is QH over W in. So you can play around with these two parameters and can find a correlation between COP of heat pump and the COP of uh, refrigeration. Now, what is the second law of thermodynamics? Second law of thermodynamics has two statements based on these two main devices that we just described. Uh, heat engine and the refrigeration or heat pump system. First one is a Kelvin Planck statement. It says that it's impossible that you build a device. Yes? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Yes, the, you, put, you can put them under the umbrella of performance, system performance. But in heat engine, what it does, it gets heat from you and it delivers power to you. So we need power there, right? That's why you define performance to be power divided by heat. In. But in the refrigeration cycle, Heat is the main result that we're looking for. For example, in your fridge, you're going to get heat from the fridge. We don't care that much about what we spend. We do care about that, but that's the input. Right? And that is why the performance there is defined to be COP. But again, both comes under the umbrella of performance. Okay? This is a specific for refrigeration system. Yes. I mean, all heat pumps or... Mm, uh, ref, ref, 
Pardon? Yes, yes. Because here the power is input and the heat is output, while for the first cycle, heat is input and the power is a desired output. Okay? Now, so the Kelvin Planck statement says that it's impossible that you build or design a device which operates in a cycle and gets the energy from a high temperature source and deliver all of that to work. I mean, you, you can convert all of that to work. So if you get the one unit of energy from a source and get one unit of power, that's impossible. Nature won't let you do that. And it means that. It, uh, so if this is 100 kilowatt coming from the source and 100 kilowatt of power, this never happens. So this happens only if you QLB0 means that no heat waste, no heat loss. But if, if this was the case, if all the Q would be converted to W, it means that my efficiency would be 100%, right? But this never happens in reality. You always have heat loss. So this Q dot L to be zero, it never happens. That's what the Kelvin Planck says. Clausius is also a similar thing but it's for refrigeration system. It means that you cannot build a device which works between a low temperature and a high temperature reservoir and can get heat from this low temperature and give it to the high temperature. It means that this W, which is needed, I mean, all devices, they need this W, refrigeration system, to do this job. Uh, so if you have a five kilojoule here, if you're going to take all this 5 kilojoule to this guy, on W of 0, never happens. Meaning, the COP that we defined here to be, for example, it was QL over W. If W is 0, it's going to be infinity, and this would never happen. So COP is always less than infinity. For example, for air source heat pump, we can say that the COP is going to be around 2 to 3. So for a heat pump, um, in practical, for heat pump, which is actually Q dot H over W, is between 2 to 3. Huh? Well, it's a good thing. It means that for uh, COP of 2, for example, it means that for every unit of work or electricity that you give to, the, to, the, to your system, to the heat pump, it can deliver 2 units of heat to you. I'm sure you heard that UK is now moving toward using heat pumps for um, heating the buildings for this net zero target by 2050. I think 80% of the homes in the UK will be equipped with heat pumps by 2050. Um, it, the cost is still high of the, the, the system, but it's a lot more efficient and it, it's a lot more environmentally friendly system. Okay? Now, so these are the two statements that is actually the representative of second law of uh, thermodynamics. Now, so we just now, based on the second law, we say that, okay, we understand and we learned that 100% efficiency for the heat engine and or COP of infinity is impossible. Right? We know that it never happens. But the question then would be, what is the maximum performance that I can achieve if I build or design a system? Now, I'm going to give you an example. You are building a heat engine as an engineer, which can operate between the atmospheric or a standard temperature and a boiler which operates at, I don't know, 600 or 700 degrees C. You're building a machine here. The, the machine task or the job is to get that energy from a 600 degree C boiler, which has been given by the boiler to the working fluid, and deliver it to work. So we know that all that energy will not be converted to work because that's the second law of wireless, the second law of thermodynamics. But the question would be then what could be possibly the maximum efficiency we can get from this system? Right? Are you guys following me? Because I see that most of you are distracted by your mobile or you're taking naps. And are you tired? You want to take a break? No? Could you say something, please? Would you, you want to take a break? No? Okay, good. So, um, but we're going to break in 15, 20 minutes, okay? We'll go to a, a break 10 minutes. Then.
Now, to answer this question, what's the maximum efficiency I can get, I need you to introduce you to a process which is called reversible process, or the term which is called irreversibility. Now, a reversible process, thermodynamically, is a process that if it happens in one direction, if you reverse it back to where the original state was, you should not impose any impact or any influence on your environment or even the system itself. I'll tell you what. If I have this, is a, 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 um, something like that. If I, if I move this pen along this one and it goes up and I bring it back here, do you think is it a reversible process or it is not? So I was here, went to the top, and now coming back to where I was. Is it reversible or it's not? Can I have some answers, please? It is what? Any other views? This row, you guys are very quiet. Say something. I'm not going to eat you if you say something. But say it. Guys, is it reversible or ever irreversible? Just say it. Huh? Reversible. Why? Why is it reversible? And if it is irreversible, why is it irreversible? Okay. Well, although, I mean, I went up and I came back here. Although I came back to where this guy was, this, the pen was. However, because of the friction, heat has been generated because of this friction. And the heat has been transferred to the environment. So I came back to where I was, but my environment became warmer because of this, the friction that we have here, right? Um, and this is called one of the source of forms of irreversibility, friction. So reversible process is an ideal process that happens only on paper. It never happens in reality. We never, we, we never have a reversible process. All the processes are, are irreversible. But we define reversible process because this is the best and ideal process that could happen in the thermodynamic cycle. So I'll come back to, to reversible cycle later on. But to give you an example here, is, this is a nice one. This shows that you have a, um, you have a, a piston cylinder configuration here. This is a, um, uh, a gas inside. Uh, so if I'm going to just, uh, if I just, if the piston goes up, right, and if I push it back to bring it where it was, I came back to where I was. However, because of this compression process that I made, heat will be generated, and the heat will be dissipated to the environment. The piston came back to its original state or position, but the heat has been transferred, and the environment became warmer. So this is an irreversible process. But the thing is that if you have, I don't know, if you have nothing to do, and you have your age to spend. And if you, if, if you do this process in a way that you go very, very slowly, very tiny, tiny, tiny steps to move your piston up. So what you do, you're actually more or less making sure that no heat will be transferred while you're going up. And also you come back when you put these a small weights, very small weights, I don't know, 0.1 grams or whatever. And you're coming back very, very slow position. So um, you're probably going to come back to where you were, and then no heat has been taken in and no heat has been given out. And there, maybe you can say that your process is reversible. But this is almost impossible to do in reality. Right. Now, based on this reversible process, which is an ideal process, a cycle has been, is defined, or which is called the Carnot cycle, which is a, comes from the name of a, a French military engineer, Nicolas Carnot. Sorry, <laughs> Sadi Nicolas Carnot. Nicolas Sadi Carnot, whatever. Um, and the cycle is, has a, this feature like this, which I'm showing on a, the schematic here, and also on the PV and the TS diagram. Um, I'm sure you remember these thermodynamic diagrams from Thermo 1. It has four main processes, which are written here. Process 1 to 2 is an 
is a reversible and isothermal heat addition process. From 2 to 3, it's a reversible but adiabatic expansion. That's the second process. Third one is an isothermal but heat rejection process. And a step 4 to 1 is actually a reversible and adiabatic compression process. Now, this is the answer of what we just we said. We asked earlier the question, if I cannot achieve 100% efficiency for a heat engine, what would be the best cycle that I can, theoretically, I can design to operate between the high temperature source and the low temperature source and give me the maximum efficiency? It's called Carnot cycle. So the same terminology applies to refrigeration cycles as well. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, thanks. The problem is when I'm going to annotate, I don't know, there's a mismatch between the pointer and where I put the line. Uh, let's see if I try it here. You see, I'm going to just, on the French, I'm going to draw, put the line through. You see that it comes down. I don't know why. You see what? No. Anyway. Now, uh, the same could be, uh, will, is, there is the same Carnot cycle for a refrigeration system. This is, again, the two cycles, the PV and, and, and the, um, the PV diagrams. One for, uh, this is a refrigeration cycle on the right, and the left is for the heat engine. Now, how the efficiency will be defined? It can be shown that uh, the efficiency of the heat engine, a Carnot one, is that written to be 1 minus TL over TH. Remember that in reality, for a real and actual cycle, efficiency is 1 minus QL over QH. While Carnot says that efficiency is 1 minus TL over TH. Right? Now, here's the question. Well, before I ask you the question, there's a these three things here, it's very interesting. It says that if you have designed a system, if you calculate, or even you build a system and you measure the efficiency, you can compare that efficiency that you obtain against Carnot efficiency. Right? If it is smaller than the Carnot efficiency, means that your system is an irreversible system and it's an actual system. If it is equal to Carnot efficiency, means that your system is Carnot system, but remember that it never happens in reality. It's only on the paper. But if, you have, if your efficiency that you're getting from your system is bigger than Carnot efficiency, that's impossible. You're making a mistake. That never happens. So accordingly, I mean, this is a nice example. It says that an inventor claims to have developed a heat engine that receives 700 kilojoules of heat from a source at 2 to 7 degrees C, so he says, okay, I have a source, the temperature 2 to 7 degrees C, and I can get the heat of at the uh, 700 kilojoules of heat, and produce 350 kilojoules of network. It says that out of that 700 kilojoules, 350, almost half of it is converted to work while there is a sink at the temperature of 17 degrees C. Can you say that whether this claim is right or is wrong? Huh? Does do something. It's very simple to do. Why are you looking at me? I mean, I, can't, I don't do this. It's, it's you to do this. Yes, please, guys. Try it. Say if this guy, if, if, if this claim is... is, is is reasonable. Mm. Are you telling me something? You're talking to yourself. No, what you're saying is correct. 
that he mentioned a very good point, guys. In your calculation, remember that these temperatures, they should be in absolute uh, values, not in degrees C. If it's degree C, you need to convert it to Kelvin. If it is Fahrenheit, you convert it to Rankine. Yes, please. It is what? Because? So what is the coronal value of the coronal efficiency? 0.42, that's fantastic. So what you need to do, I mean, initially, uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go exit for the screen because I'm going to annotate here again. So initially, you would say, that, okay, yeah, 50% efficiency, that's not that bad. I mean, it, it, it's, um, it, it's not 100%. So the guy says that my efficiency, thermal efficiency is 350 divided by 700, so it's nearly 50%, so it's less than 100%. It does not violate, it does not violate, violate second law, right? But we have another thing to check with that, I mean that and that's the Carnot efficiency. We just said that efficiency of Carnot or which is actually efficiency of thermally reversible cycle is 1 minus TL over TH, right? It's going to be 1 minus 17 plus 273 to convert it to Kelvin divided by 227 plus 273 and the value is, is it 40? 42%. So this efficiency of 50% is higher than 42% so this is not possible, this is impossible. Now, if you are the best engineer and if you can design the best machine that operates between the 2 to 7 degrees C and absorbs 700 kg and your sink temperature is 17 degrees C, the maximum efficiency you can get is 42%. So meaning that you can convert your W net would be 0.42 times 700, don't know, how much is that? Maybe 294 kilojoules, I believe. Is it? Am I correct? Okay. It's not 350. And the rest is actually wasty. Okay. Um, so, this is a very nice uh, question that they said, consider your home refrigerator with all kitchen doors and windows closed. Right? I mean, your kitchen is, is enclosed. No mass or heat can come in or leave. So it's a very good insulated kitchen. It's not one of those open planning that we have. It's just a closed kitchen. If you leave the fridge door open, you open the fridge door. Then what happens to the... Um, are you okay? Are you, your nose bleeding? Are you okay? No, that gentleman there. I thought that he knows his bleeding. Now, here, tell me what happens to the kitchen. Is it, it gets warmer, or it becomes cooler, or, or, or doesn't, or we don't know. It depends on the condition. Who says, who is responsible? Raise your hand, please. Yes, please. Why? Have you tried it at home? Seems that you're saying from experience. <laughs> no, that's correct. Um, but initially, when you leave, when you open the door, you have a, a mass of cold air inside the fridge. It comes into the kitchen area. So initially, the temperature drops, or it becomes a bit cold in your, in, in your fridge, right? But after some time, what happens is that you actually have a closed system. The fridge doors are open, right? If you take your kitchen, it's a closed system. But you're taking electricity. Energy is coming through the electricity. And it converts to heat. Um, and as such, the temperature inside, the free, inside your kitchen rises. So again, initially, when you, leave the door, when you open the door, initially the temperature drops. But after some time, it heats up. And as our friend mentioned, it actually temperature rises and rises and rises until your fridge is broken. 
Okay. Um, I think we can take a um, few minutes break. How long do you need, guys? Ten? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with five to three. Decreases and then increases. Pardon? Sorry, I don't understand. Yes, yes, please, yeah, sure. Hi. Hi for the pocket. One person reduction in pressure. Oh, just one person of atmospheric pressure. So it's going to be no, 0 0.01 bar. So well, that's, that's very low. So are you building something to do this? Theory. Well, um, I mean, this is it's not it's not a difficult thing to do because um, I mean, in terms of theoretic, you can't, it's not difficult to analyze. So you have two states: your initial state, which you have a atmospheric pressure, atmospheric temperature, right? And you're going to reduce the pressure to a certain pressure of P2. Yeah, the pressure form. Yes, but if temperature remains constant, then you have a a pressure at the beginning and a pressure at the, at the, in the uh, second stage, right? And then you also have the volume of the gas. Look, if you wait for the next, next lecture, no, not that one. This formula. This is only for the case when you go from one pressure to another pressure. If the density doesn't change, you can work out the work to be your volume times change of pressure. But since the system is closed, it shouldn't be a big deal to, to do that. It's, it's a simple thing to do, I would say. But your system is insulated, right? The pipe. Yeah. Although, I mean, you should know that your temperature drops, effectively. Well, no, sorry. The air temperature can remain constant. You know, it's very much like that. Um, you've probably seen experiments that you have water at the atmospheric temperature. If you're going to boil it in the kitchen, you should put it on the oven at the temperature go 80 degrees C. Like that. But you can boil your water at the temperature of that 20 degrees C. How can you do this? If you put it in a chamber and you vacuum it and you reduce the pressure, you bring down the pressure up to much below than atmospheric pressure and then it will boil. Today? What was the email about? You complain about me? Oh, you you're emailed me because you're leaving. Thanks for letting me know. You're coming next week? Yeah. Okay, see you. So, the, yeah, you can reduce it. The temperature remains constant. But you can work this out by this. If you have a volume, and you can just multiply by the change of pressure. The pump? Yeah, yeah. So the higher, the lower the pressure becomes in the tube, the lower your pump work will be. Yeah. 
Let, let's have a discussion with this after the class, okay? Yeah, after the class. We will continue on that. Well, entropy, entropy is what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, when it comes to irreversibility, one way to actually quantify these irreversibilities is where the term entropy comes in. Um, so irreversibilities are actually a physical process, the actual process, such as heat transfer, such as expansion but how we can link them to some other thermodynamic properties would be through the term entropy. Say it again. Yeah, Carnot cycle is a reversible cycle. It has four processes, and all four processes are reversible. So the reversible cycle efficiency is, is equivalent to Carnot cycle efficiency. No? Are they? Did I have it here? No, no. I, I, yeah, no, I, I mentioned here earlier. You may miss that. Uh, sometimes we say L means low or H means high. Some textbook C means cold and 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 H means hot. Yes. Yeah, uh, no, well, not 0.5, yeah, this is the efficiency that the person claims, but this is a carnal efficiency, not 0.4, the point, yeah, this is correct, so this, since this one is bigger than this, then what he claims is wrong, this claim is not reasonable. Uh, even if it was the same, that thing would never happen in reality. Only on paper is correct. Yeah. If you if you if you implement your design in reality, it will not be 0.4. So this is wrong efficiency, not correct, reasonable. This is what you have theoretically the maximum you can get. But if you do in reality, if you do in reality, it would be not 0.33, not 0.35. That's not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, yeah, 100 or 150, yes. Or 100 over 150 or 1 minus, sorry, 50 over 150 or 1 minus 100 over 150. The one that you wrote is correct. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. And then, um, question I have, why is the net force equal to the change in the um, That's because um, the first law of thermodynamics for a closed system, it says that energy coming in should be equal to energy leaving the system, right? So, um, so what is the energy into the system is cubic. Living is W plus QL. So W is plus QL should be QH. Is the heat where the vapor is taken with itself out? I mean, your flame has a very high temperature of 100 degrees C. And based on that, let's say you give 100 kilojoule energy to the can. But your vapor, part of the energy of the vapor is also spinning the can and the lead the lower temperature vapor leaving the, the can. That energy that vapor takes with itself outside is at your key. Okay. Okay. Um.
Hello again. Now, um, I'm going to talk about the... Um, oh, gosh. He was... You had the muscle to do that, man. Look, um, the, uh, the second thing I want to talk is, is about entropy. So we use the concept of ent entropy. So these are, I, need, uh, I mean, this, uh, uh, I need to be a bit, uh, do it a bit fast. Um, can you tell me what is your understanding of entropy? Entropy? Huh? Come on, say something. Okay, any idea? No? But you had the entropy in term of one, right? Is there anyone here that never heard the term entropy? Who have heard entropy or knows what's entropy? Who, who doesn't know what's entropy? Those who doesn't raise their hands, then, then what, what's your guy? What do you do? You, you either know or you do not know. Uh oh. <laughs> That's a smart answer. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Who knows entropy? Please go ahead. You want to say something? No. Look, well, uh, you might heard say, people say that entropy means randomness, or entropy means something is busy, or, or, or whatever like this. But um, the definition of entropy, I'm trying to explain to you the best I can. It's not an easy concept to learn. Uh, so entropy is actually is defined as the number number of ways energy can be distributed in a system of, of molecules. So let me give you an example. I think I, one of my handwriting from last year is uploaded on, on Blackboard, so I'm trying to remember what I said that time. If you, if you imagine that you have a system of maybe a gas or something in a container, and you have three molecules inside, and just to differentiate these molecules, I'm going to say that one of them is a triangle, a circle, and, and a square, right? But I have only one quantum of energy within this system. One quantum of energy, right? How this energy of one quantum energy could be held by these molecules, right? There are different ways. If I can draw this level of quantum to be, uh, this is zero, uh, if this is one, let's say two, three, and, and so on. These are the quantum of energy we have, right? My system has one quantum of energy, right? The number of ways that it could happen is that if this, this two, molecules, they have nothing, and the square has one quantum of energy. Remember that these level up, these are inaccessible, because the total energy is one. I cannot go to level of two to three. If you want, more energy should be given. So I'm limited to one quantum of energy, and I have three molecules there. They're going to decide who should carry on the whole one to this one quantum of energy. So that's one way. Another way would be that if my uh, triangle in here, let's say, and then, or maybe this guy, and, and sorry, and triangle here and the square and the circle here. The third one would be that, it's like this, sorry. So I have a circle and I have a triangle and this guy here. So how many ways the system can actually distribute the energy? That three. And this is a, a parameter which represents the entropy of the system. It's not entropy, but that's actually what entropy means. Look, in all the three cases, the total energy of the system is one, but the number of ways energy has been distributed within these molecules in three, right? And that is the representation of entropy, right? Did it remind you anything of entropy? Probably, yes, right? Now, why this is important for us, Let, let's take a look at the diffusion, a, a diffusion problem. It means that if you have a, a hot slab, this is a hot slab, it has a high temperature, a higher energy, and it comes into contact 
with the a cold slab. Let's say this is a cold one. We know that energy will be transferred from these, the hot slab, slab to the cold slab, right? Now, we're going to find out then what happens to entropy here. To better, to better give you an um, understanding, so leave this, leave this for now. Let's imagine that I, I'm, I'm Yasser. I'm going to draw something like my hand, but don't laugh at me. This is, I don't know, left hand. <laughs> this is right hand, right hand, right. And I have three apples, right? Three apples. How can I distribute the three apples between my, my two hands? Three apples means I have three quantum of energy, but there are two molecules here. And I'm going to distribute these three units of energy between these two molecules. What would be the number of ways that I can do this? Can you tell me something? Yeah. But this is not my hand, really, if you have questions. It's just Yeah, okay. Three, three, zero, and? Zero, three. And? Two, one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the number of states here is? Four. Four. Right. Now, what's your name? My name is Faris. F-A-R-I-S. Don't we? Okay. F -A -R F -A -R -I -S. F-A-R-I-S. Okay. Sorry if I drew your hand in that way. <laughs> but here I had, here I had, um, I had the three quantum of energy or three apples. But you have only one quantum of energy or one apple, right? What would be the number of ways? You have one zero and zero one. Okay, so that's going to be two, right? You're following me so far? So if I'm going to be honest and share the apples that I have with Fires, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong, mate. Don't worry. Your name is fine? <laughs> fires, okay. So if I get in touch with him, if I get in touch with him, and if I'm going to come into an equilibrium, okay. If I if I'm gonna come into an equilibrium in terms of in terms of number of apples, what would happen is that I would have two apples, right? Yeah. And you would also have two apples. Then can you tell me the number of ways that apples could be distributed in our hands? How, how what would that would be? So I'm gonna say that after um, exchanging um, energy. And here I'm saying apples, right? The number of ways now, so I'm going to draw the hands of both of us. So it's going to be the same thing, but it's my hands and your hand the same, so don't worry about that. So we each of us going to have two apples, right? So the number of ways it could be distributed, these two quantum of energy between these two molecules that we have, is going to be one, one, huh? zero, two. Two, zero. You agree with me? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to call this initial of this, and this is going to call again initial. I'm going to call myself to be a system. I'm calling myself a system, and I'm going to call my friend to be my surrounding. Okay. Because a system is in contact with the surrounding and is exchanging apples of energy, let's say after they, they were separate now. When they come in contact with each other, they exchange energy, they exchange apple, now they came into a thermal equilibrium in terms of temperature if it was the hot and cold slabs. In terms of apple, they had the same number of apples. And both of them, so the second state is going to be three. Both for system and for, and for surrounding. Right. Are you following me so far? Okay, so what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to, how can I get to the end here? 
So I'm going to calculate now or come up with the change of entropy. Now, before saying that, this number of state is what the representative entropy, and we can show that entropy itself could be the Stefan Boltzmann constant times the Lagarde Neperian of this gamma number of state that we have, and that is entropy. And this case is a constant parameter, and I'll show you later on in the lecture what the kappa is. Yes, please. It is Boltzmann constant, yes. Yeah. Well, so that's entropy. Now, tell me, if you're going to calculate the change of entropy of me, myself. Hi, hi, say hi for me as well. <laughs> so, for Yasser, guys, remember that, which is actually the system. I call myself a system. Initial number of states was four, while the final state was, was three. You following me? I was here four, here is four, and here I'm three. Now, the change in entropy of the system is K logarithm Neperian four minus, sorry, is three is the second state, minus K ln four or if you like, going to be k ln 3 divided by 4. <coughs> this is a smaller than 0. It's a negative number. While, while for first, I hope that I write your name correct, which was our surrounding, initial number of state was 2, while the final number of state was 3. Now, the delta S of surrounding here I know that you will complain about my handwriting later on, but please don't do that, okay? I cannot do anything about this. It's going to be kappa ln 3 divided by 2, and it's a bigger number. It's, it's bigger than 0. What does it mean here is that since the energy has been taken from me, because I have three apples and then it came up two apples, so my entropy is reduced, but a friend's entropy has increased. But what is matter here is the total entropy because of this exchange, because of this, this interaction, that we call it as delta S of total, which is delta S of our system plus delta S of surrounding. If you do that, so let me just, anyone has a, uh, maybe a, a calculator. Can you tell me what would be the ln 3 over 4? No need to do that. I have the Excel here. So it's going to be um, ln logarithm Neperian 3 over 4 is minus 0.29. So it's k minus 0.29 and this guy ln 1, 1 and half, ln 3 divided by 2 is 0.4 and this guy is k times 0.4 so it's positive, this is negative so my entropy has reduced while your friend's entropy has increased but the total entropy will be the sum of this guy and this guy and it will be k times Not 0.12, and it's a positive number. It's a very important finding. It says that a system and a surrounding, they might interact and exchange heat or energy, information, apple, whatever it is. Um, one of them could have reduction entropy. The other one has increased in entropy. But the thing is that the total entropy of the system and surrounding is always positive. It means that the entropy is always increasing in the universe. And that's why they come into the concept of saying that equilibrium, balance, I don't know, equality between the people, human being, everything, it, it happens. Um, because the entropy is rising. A, the other way around, what never happens. You can, I mean, what I can do, since I'm a lecturer, I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm actually an academic, so I have the force, so I have the power, and I can get 
is only apple from his hand, and mine becomes four. Um, but if you do that calculation, the reverse direction. So the, the natural direction is that since I have more, I should give it to him. So both come into equilibrium. My entropy reduces, his entropy rises. But in general, we're adding entropy to the whole universe. Equilibrium, because of this equilibrium. But if, they, if I do it the other way around, I mean, if I take on, it's only apple from me, then we will end up with saying that delta S of total would be negative. Delta S total negative. And this is not what happens in reality in nature. And this is, and this is impossible. Okay? Now, um, and this is what is entropy about. So in, another thing that you can say is that um, if you have a system of molecules, um, so the higher number of energy, you agree with me that if you're, uh, for this example, we only looked into one quantum of energy, right? And we had only three molecules. So what if I have, I don't know, 100 quantum of energy, and I have 100 of uh, molecules, right? That the number of a state would be a lot more. Do you agree with me? That's what we don't, I mean, it would be very difficult to know the number of ways energy could be distributed. This 100 quantum of energy be distributed among 100, 100 number of molecules. So we are more ignorant about the number of a state of this system. The more you're ignorant about the number of a state of the system, means that the higher the entropy of the system. You following me? Right? This is why when you add heat to a system, the temperature rises, the molecules interact with each other, they move around. Um, the position, we don't know about their position. We don't know which level of energy each of the molecules they carry. That means the entropy is, is, is increasing. Right. Now, based on that, the entropy has been actually quantified to, uh, to be linked to other property of a system. And that was a, um, defined in this form. I'm sure that you've seen this, that the change of the entropy of the system is linked to the... Um, I hope that you can see it. Yeah. So, um, for the reversible process, the delta S is actually delta Q over T for entire reversible process. If I do the integral, delta S can be S1 minus S1, which is integral delta Q over T, but it's only for internally reversible process. You know that, but in reality, we do not have a reversible process. And that's why while we exchanged apples, there was an increase in entropy. And that's why delta S of a system, uh, which is a cons it's called the principle of, just a little bit, oopsie. Principle of an increase in entropy is uh, a similar system is always bigger than delta Q over T. If I'm going to convert this, in, this inequality form to be an equal sign, it's going to be this guy here plus S generation. There will be always a generation of entropy persistence. Now, if generation is zero, if there are no generation, then the change of entropy is Q over T, integral Q over T. It happens only for reversible systems. But in reality, we have also some generation of entropy. Uh, an example is a nice one. It's, it's very similar that we have just done for this apple and the hot slab and the cold slab. It says that you have a gas at temperature T and environment temperature T naught. And your gas losing heat. So the heat is going to the environment. Um, and then you could calculate the change of entropy for a system, which is minus delta Q over T. Why? Because the heat has been rejected from the system. While your environment, it absorbs the heat. And then the, it's going to be delta Q over T plus. So for the gas, since it loses the energy, the entropy drops, while for the surrounding, the entropy increases. However, the sum of these two, which is a delta S total, it's always, you can work this out, that is always positive. The same that we did for the apple thing. So let me pass this on quickly. Uh, there is a, 
again, a, um, a summary. If the gener entropy generation, which is actually delta S of total, is the entropy that we generate. If it is bigger than zero, it's an irreversible, hence an actual process. If it is zero, it's a reversible process, which happens only on the paper. If it's smaller than zero, it's impossible, it never happens. So this is why we, we say that processes occur always in a direction where the entropy rises. Okay? If you have a process where entropy doesn't change, it happens only on the paper, not in reality. Also, if you have a system, or sorry, if you have a process where your entropy is re reduced, that never happens. That's impossible. Okay? Now, you also can have a comparison with the entropy of the solids, liquid, and gases. You know that for solids, entropy is much lower. For liquids, a bit higher, and the gas, much higher. If you imagine that, how the molecules would behave in each of the three states, and how ignorant we will be respect to the position, velocity, or temperature of these molecules in these three states, you would understand that gases should have a higher entropy than the others. Um, and this formula is here, so KLN pi, or the gamma that we had, and this kappa or K is actually the Boltzmann constant. Okay. Um, have you heard about the Gibbs equation in Thermal 1? You worked this out, TDS relation or Gibbs equation? Yes? Okay, so I'm just going to go briefly over that. And Gibbs equations is a very two relations that we don't really use them in Thermal 2, but we will be using, using the outcome of this Gibbs equation for an open system. These two are very important systems because it actually links entropy to other properties of a system. Here, STUPV, or here can be entropy, temperature, enthalpy, volume, and pressure. That, these, these are the, the importance of, of Gibbs equations. You want to take a break, guys? Huh? Who wants to go out? Who wants to sit in the class and me continue? Only two. I don't know what the rest of you guys are going to do. I don't understand. Okay. So, so this, this gives equation. So why are we using them? I mean, here what I'm showing is actually how we can actually prove this, uh, this equation here. It's a very simple mathematical manipulation. So try it at home. It's not a difficult thing to understand. It's, it's when we use this for an open system. You remember that for an open system, the first law of thermodynamics, this is first law of thermodynamics written in this form. And these are the two Gibbs equations that we have. Now, if the device that I'm dealing with, which does a process for us, if that device is adiabatic and reversible, Okay, if it is adiabatic, means no heat transfer, hence W is dH. If it is reversible, remember that we mentioned if it is reversible means that no dS here, so this guy is going to be zero, and dH is VdP. If I take dW to here, which I've written in the following here, here. I will end up by saying that delta W will be minus VDP. And if I do the integral, it will be work is equal to minus, in, uh, minus integral 1 to 2 nu DP. For some devices such as pumps, which they deal with liquids, this is specific volume from one pressure to another pressure doesn't change much. Right? I mean, it actually shows the specific volume. If you think that, I mean, the volume of the water, it doesn't really change much if you go from one bar, let's say, to five bar, right, in pressure. That's why it's still liquid. So we can take this out of the integral, and you will end up by using, saying that the pump work could be a specific volume times the change of pressure. 
This is very important for Amilo. And next week, while I'm analyzing a ranking cycle, and while we're going to calculate the pump work, we will be using this formula a lot. Okay? Now, for the... Uh, it can be shown that for ideal gases, we can write the change of entropy to be in this form. So again, you, I'm sure that you can do it at home. It's not a difficult thing to do. If you use this Gibbs equations, like say, I can show one of them to you guys. So you can do the other one. So TDS is DU plus PDV, right? If I write this one, the TDS is DU plus PDV, and I know that PV equal to RT, right? Or P is RT over V. So I will plug this guy. Uh, this one instead of here. Then I would have the TDS. You agree with me that for ideal gas, I can write DU to be CVDT, right? DU CVTD from last week lecture plus P going to be RT over V, RT over V, and this is PV. Um, oopsie. So I'm going to rewrite this again. TDS is CVDT. It's going to be RT times DV over V. I just moved the V here, right? So I'm going to divide all three, three times, both sides by T, temperature. If you do this, you will have DS is CV DT over T plus R DV over V. You okay with this, what I've done? Oopsie. You, you okay what I've done from here to here? Uh, this T has been cancelled, a T been added here, and this T been cancelled. Now if I take the integral of this guy, assuming that CV is not a function of temperature, then I will end up that S2 minus S1 equal to CV, logarithmic perian T2 over T1, plus R logarithmic perian V2 over V1. So this is the guy that is here. You can use the second relation for Gibbs, and you can prove this one as well. Right? It's not a big deal. It's an easy thing. But don't worry, you will not be questioned about this in the exam. Now, I just told you about this, why it is so important, this formula. So remember this, we'll be using this a lot. Another thing is actually an isentropic process. Remember that isentropic process, again, is... What is isentropic process? Mathematically or thermodynamically is a process wherein the entropy doesn't change, or S1 is equal to S2. But why this is happening, why for an isentropic S2 should be called S1, if you go back to the formula that we have for entropy, this guy here, so tell me when S2 will be equal to S1 in this guy, in this formula, S2, is when this will be zero. This happens when there are no heat transfers, so Q is zero, which means adiabatic, adiab adiabatic, or Q is zero, and no entropy generation means that reversible. So this guy be zero, and it's reversible. Right? So if a system, a process, is adiabatic, and reversible, the change of entropy during that process is zero, means that entropy at one is equal to entropy at two, and this is called isentropic. Why this concept is important? It remember about the corner that I told you. Because in thermodynamic cycles, the systems, the cycles that we deal with, they have many, many cycles, such as pumps, compressors or turbines mainly, um, the pump 
compressors or turbines, they will do the best of their work if they operate isentropically. What does it mean? It means that there are no heat loss through the turbines. Just imagine turbine. What is the turbine's job? You're going to give, him, give the turbine a high quality energy, high temperature vapor, for example. You have a question? Okay. And then you expect to get work or power from the turbine. If the turbine has heat loss, some of your energy already been lost, so you don't want that. So your turbine must be adiabatic. You're following me so far? Another thing, if your turbine internally has reversible inside, I mean, so it has irreversibility, such that there's many frictions between components inside the turbine. So part of the energy that is coming to the turbine, instead of being converted to work, is used to overcome this friction thing. Right? Because of this irreversibility. So if we do not have any heat loss, if we do not have friction or irreversibilities, a good chunk of the inlet work will be converted, heat will be converted to work. But remember that this never happens in reality again. We always have heat transfer. We always have friction. We always have irreversibilities. But the best turbine is a turbine which operates under adiabatic and reversible conditions. That is called isentropic. Um, so when you analyze your thermodynamic cycle and you're analyzing each of these components, you always can compare your actual process, let's say turbine, compared to what it would do if my turbine was isentropic. By comparing these two, we define a parameter which is called isentropic efficiency. And then I'll come back to this isentropic efficiency later on, okay? Um, so that's the first, that's the isentropic process. S2 is equal to S1. It's all, only when adiabatic and reversible. Um, these are isentropic relations, guys. We will use them a lot while we're dealing with uh, gas power cycle. These are for ideal gases, these formulas. You will be given these in the exam as formula sheet, but we use them a lot while we're dealing with the um, uh, gas power cycles. Now, just, I, I just mentioned to you about these um, comparing a turbine which works in reality uh, generates power or its enthalpy changes from an inlet to, a, to an outlet. And the turbine's job is to produce work for us. That's the actual turbine. If that turbine could work isentropically, that would produce another amount of work. The ratio of these two is called the turbine efficiency. Now, on a TS or on a HS diagram, this is going to look like this. On a TS, this is an uh, enthalpy. You guys, you guys just arrived or you went out and come in? You were here? I don't recognize your face. Here. Uh, how can I make it smaller? Okay, oopsie. We are here. Look. Okay. I need your attention here because we will be using TS or HS diagram a lot, guys. TS and HS are very similar. This is enthalpy and this is entropy, right? What does a turbine do? Turbine, in turbine, we have gas expansion from a higher pressure to a lower pressure, right? So we expand from a P1 to a P2, which is exit pressure, and this is inlet pressure. If my turbine would operate isentropically, it should be a straight line because S2, S2 should be equal to S1. This is an isentropic process in a turbine. I denote it here by S, means isentropic state, a turbine exit. But in reality, process in turbine is not isentropic. In reality, 
entropy at the turbine exit is always higher than the entropy at the turbine inlet. Right? You're following me? Good. Yes? Okay. So this is the actual state of the turbine, which it has an entropy which is higher than the inlet one. You get me? Now, that's why the that's why this is going to be the actual process that occurs in a turbine. You go from a state one to an actual state TO, which has an entropy higher than the inlet entropy. But as entropically, exit state has entropy the same as the inlet state. Now, if my turbine works in reality, the power work, actual turbine work, is H2A minus H1. So this is the distance. This is the actual work. This is WA I'm writing here. If it could work isentropically, which only happens on paper, is H2S minus H1, is this length. And this is WS. The ratio of these two is called turbine efficiency. Now, you, you, get, you understand that WS is bigger than WA. That's why this is always less than one. OK. Yes? OK. Same could be said about pumps or compressors that you go from a low pressure P1 to a high pressure P2 if you work out the compressor work would be H2S minus H1 divided by H2A minus H1 it's different from turbine because you have only definition that you have WS over WA because compressor needs work so it would demand less work if it could work isentropically. Compressor is going to go from 1 bar to 10 bar. But you have only, I don't know, 50 kilowatt power to give it to it. If it's isentropic, if we use all this power input to go from 1 bar to 10 bar. But in reality, compressor has its own problem inside. It has irreversibilities, frictions. It also has some heat loss. Only some of that heat power will be used to do the compression job for you and the rest would be lost. So that's why, in, in reality, compressor would demand more work, more power. Sorry, would demand more power to do the compression for us. And another component, so these are two mo most important ones, the pumps and the compressor, pumps and turbines, and we also have diffusers. Diffuser job is different. It doesn't really deal with the, uh, um, what do you say, power or work, it actually deals with the increasing the uh, kinetic energy at the end of the exits. Again, these are terms of one thing, please refer to those, but I've, I've written here. We will be using these nozzle and diffuser formulas while we will be analyzing a uh, turbo jet engine or uh, gas turbines for aerospace applications. So we'll have a lecture toward the end of the semester about those. Um, this is a very nice example uh, that we can try. Um, The, 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 the aim of this example is to show you what would be the power required for a pump or a compressor if they wanted to do a compression from A pressure to another pressure. You know that both of these two components, they increase the pressure for us, as we discussed the other week. But pumps deals with liquids, while compressor they deal with gases in, in vapor phase. Now, the question here says that um, there are two devices, pump, compressor, both the inlet condition is 100 kilopascal. The pump inlet is saturated liquid. By the way, one of the guys asked me about this TS diagram and this vapor doom. Is there anybody here doesn't know about this vapor doom and thermodynamic diagrams? Huh? Do you know what I mean by saturated liquid or saturated vapor? 
No, except you. No, no, don't say that. Who else? Who, do, who knows what is saturated liquid or saturated vapor? You don't know? Come on. No. Here, saturated liquid, saturated vapor? You don't know or you're shy to say, please at least tell, it, it, it matters for me. Shall I explain it to you or I should leave it and then continue? Tell me what do you want me to explain? What is TS diagram and vapor doom thing? Quick explanation. Huh? Quick explanation. Okay, you go ahead now. My man, well done. Yes. So I'm just going to go briefly over it, but please again l read over Thermo 1. It's on the lecture, I don't know, it's chapter 1, 2 or 3 of your. Yeah, that, that you're indeed right. So uh, what we will be using a, a, a lot would be this uh, PV diagram or TS diagram. I use mostly. Do you have a question, guys? No? Okay. So we have a TS diagram which we actually differentiate different phases of a of a substance. Here, let's say water. This thing here is called vapor doom. Um, this side of the vapor on the left side, we have liquid phase, right? It's liquid. Inside the doom, we have a mixture of liquid and, and vapor. Um, and outside is actually uh, superheated vapor. Superheated vapor, right? Vapor is with one O or with O U in English? It depends what you're talking about. English, vapor. One O. I said, oh, in England, in England. O U. O U. Vapor. Right? And that's why this line, this line is called saturated liquid line. And this line here is saturated vapor line because on the right hand side is full vapor and the left side is full liquid or sometimes it's also called saturated liquid. You also have some lines like this you might have seen. These are constant pressure line. These are constant pressure lines. Right. Now, uh, if you have a um, Gosh, I, I meant to finish this today, but it seems that part of the lecture next week should be again dedicated to some of Thermo 1 stuff. But you need to be with me. I explained this, and we need to do the example. Okay? You promise to stay? Okay. Because I meant to finish this lecture, but because of these, some of the other stuff, I have to leave it for next week. Now, I'm going to imagine that you have a container, let's say here, right? And there's a liquid inside. Let's just a, a water, right? Water inside. And you add heat to this and Q heat, right? Remember that this is the cylinder piston configuration. And a weight is imposed on here. So when you have a weight on the cylinder, it means that whatever you do with the liquid inside, the pressure doesn't change. I'm adding heat. It may vaporize. The piston might go off, vaporize. But pressure inside is equivalent to the mass of this weight divided by surface area, right? You agree with me? Because that's a balance there at each state. So allow me to just delete this blue line. So I just said, here I have liquid plus vapor, right? It's a mixture. Pressure is constant. Remember that it would be a pressure. I don't know, maybe one bar, 10 bar, two bar, whatever it is. It's, let's say, a constant pressure. Constant pressure. Initial state of the water here is somewhere around here. It has a low temperature, but it is um, a compressed liquid because it is at a pressure. So what happens when I, when I add heat to my liquid? 
a temperature rises, right? Initially, temperature goes up. So I will be moving along this line. Until this point. What is that point? It's the point that when you add heat, your first molecule of the water has been converted to vapor. Right? And that is called saturated liquid. It means that below left of this line is liquid. Just right side of the line is liquid and vapor. As soon as the first molecule is converted to vapor, you're adding heat, you're continuously adding heat. The temperature doesn't change. And we will be moving along this line. And the more liquid will be converted to vapor until this point. That's why the temperature remains constant. It does make sense during phase change of liquid to vapor, solid to liquid, whatever, the temperature doesn't change. Your heat adding to the system, but the heat is used to convert the phase or change the phase of the vapor. At this point, all the liquid has been converted to vapor. So might, here is actually a silly cylinder here, the piston, and here is vapor. Right? At this stage, while you are still adding heat, the temperature of the gas rises and it goes to this stage, which is called superheated vapor phase. And this line is called saturated uh, vapor line. Remember that during this process, here to here temperature rises, during this process we have three main stages. Pressure is constant. And within this mixture region of here, temperature is also constant. I'm sure you remember the dryness fraction parameter. The dryness fraction is actually shows the ratio of the vapor inside in this mixture to the um, total uh, mass of the Make sure. Okay, we, we, are we happy so far? Right? Now, the example says that pump always deals with liquid. So I have a pump which gets, that, that is why, guys, this line, sorry, um, this is constant pressure line at 100 kilopascal. And this is another constant pressure line at one megapascal. Now, for pump, the pressure goes from here to here, so from this point to this point, from 100 kilopascal to one megapascal. But it's always in liquid phase, this is liquid. Compressor, a seal, this 100 kilopascal to one megapascal, but it's in the vapor region, right? Because compressor deals with gases. You following me? Yes or no? Yeah. The only those who are actually dealing with the mobile phone, they say yes. Others don't say anything. Okay. Now, we want to know if, if the pump is going to do this pressure rise compared to comp compressor to do this pressure rise, how much power or work would be required? Right? You remember what I told you about pumps, right? I told you about pumps, but which formula we use for, to calculate pump work is this guy here. This one. Remember that this is used only for pumps because this V, w, sorry, this V, the specific volume is constant. You cannot apply this for compressors, it's only for pumps, right? I can write this formula. While for compressors, I need to use the, the usual form of uh, first law of thermodynamics for compressors. Okay. So I'm just going to show you the solution. Um, better show you here. You said that W1 to do, which is for pump is nu times delta P. Pressure one, oopsie. P1 is 100 kilopascal, and P2 is one megapascal or 1,000 kilopascal. 
what you do, you need to go to thermodynamic table. If I can't find it. Uh oh, you see all my documents and files here. Don't see that. Um, table is I. Now, if I go to hundred kilopascal. This is 100 kilopascal, and it's all liquid, then my new going to be new F, this guy, so the value is this one. If I go to 1,000 kilopascal, it still is double zero one, right? Not that much different, double zero one here, double zero one here. That's why I'm saying that for pumps, the specific volume doesn't change much. As such, so the new F is this double zero one here times the change of pressure, P2 minus P1. And it's going to be minus 0.94 kilojoule per kilogram. Huh? But for compressor, remember that. For compressor, we can't use this formula. This formula is only for pumps. If you be with me five more minutes, then we're going, guys. I know that you're tired. But five more minutes. Okay. Um, for compressor, it's an isentropic process. Remember that compressor and pump both they do isentropically. They operate isentropically. So, uh, let's see where is it? Here, one to two. It means that adiabatic and reversible. Since it is adiabatic means that no heat transfer on W going to be H2 minus H1. For compressor, I have the pressure at state 1. I know it's saturated vapor. I can go to table and read this H value here. 100 kilopascal. Under kilopascal and H value is H, uh, HG. This HG is this guy here. And this is what I write here. Oh, by the way, it's very important again. Do you know when you are allowed to use a steam table? I mean, if you're gonna, for a property or an A state, you have pressure, temperature, whatever, to be able to read thermodynamic tables, you need to know two properties to let's say that your state is fixed. With one property, you cannot use a steam table. You need to have at least two properties, right? Now, for a state one, here, I knew it, the pressure, which was 100 kilopascal. At the same time, I knew it was saturated vapor. So everything was G there. How about the state two? What do I know about the state two? I know that its pressure is one megapascal or 1,000 kilopascal. But I need to know another property of a state two to say that my state is fixed. Vapor. Say it again. Vapor. Who says that? Yes. But vapor, the point is, if I go, it's actually superheated vapor, right? Superheated vapor. If I go to superheated vapor table, this is saturated one, um, and this is superheated vapor, right? If I look for the pressure of one megapascal, guys, it's very important, I need your attention. This is one megapascal, right? Which parameter I'm looking for? Excuse me. Which parameter I'm looking for? Enthalpy, right? H. This is H. So which H I need to take here? Huh? <coughs> Although it's vapor, it's not enough. Huh? One mega. Yeah, yeah. This is this is one megapascal. This is one megapascal. For one megapascal, for different temperatures, we have different enthalpies. Which one is the one that it should go? That's why thermodynamically we need to have two properties 
to say that my state is fixed. If I knew the temperature here, okay, 600, one megapascal, this is enthalpy, then done. But here, this is not the case. But again, we use this a lot, what I'm telling you now. But we know that my state one was fixed. We knew the pressure, we knew what saturated vapor, we read H. At the same time, we know that S2 is equal to S1 because this is isentropic. Right? So I go back to table one that I was, the, the first table for state one. For 100 kilopascal, I read the enthalpy. I also need to read the entropy or SEG, this one. I don't need it for a state one, but I need it for a state two. I write it down for a state two. And so for a state two, I know that the pressure and I know it's entropy. Now the state is fixed because I have the pressure and I have another property. Okay? Now, one megapascal 7.3. So I go to superheat. Okay, and uh, there is a... This is one megapascal, 7.3. It's somewhere between these two guys. So it's gonna be somewhere between these two H. What do you need to do? Interpolate. Exactly. But, guys, please, one more minute. Since the entropy is 7.35, and this number is 7.3, is not that inaccurate if you take this guy as the value and do not bother with interpolation. Okay? But, the best is to do interpolation anyway. If you do this, you will end up H2 to be this value, and W is 519. For compressor, you need nearly 520 kg per kilogram. For pump, it's only 0 0.9. This is a four order of magnitude, three order, four order of magnitude difference between the power requirement. Gosh, I'm tired. I'm really tired. I have two, three more meetings to go. Um, i see you next week, guys. Um, and I will continue with this. So is it possible for you to put down... Um, Say again? So, sorry, is it possible for you to put down some videos on YouTube or something that explains the difference? Because I can imagine, visualize like the difference in temperature in my head. But if you say like 4.3 entropy value and 7.3 entropy value, I, don't, I can't just visualize that in my head. Is there a YouTube video or something that can quickly explain it? What do you mean 7.4? Well, I just like the difference in entropy, like how, how it changes in different states. I, do, I don't know how to visualize that, you know, it's just I don't comprehend the definition of entropy.